not a lot of maths in what I'm going to talk about today, but I think what I wanted to get across is some points uh, relating to um, relatively careful comparison of models with data and, and what we can do as a result of that. Um, but because I guess I don't, I don't necessarily I haven't really chatted with everyone who's here today, I thought I'd give you a bit of background for what, to what we do. So we're mostly understand, interested in understanding mechanisms that drive collective cell motility and then how they would combine with um, sort of things like cell cell adhesion, cell proliferation and death to give rise to quite complicated biological processes. And as John hinted, much of the work that we've done in the group over the past few years has been in um, the context of embryo development, really kind of looking at embryo development as a, as a place to understand um, a sort of um, sort of other sort of what happens when things go wrong. So things like tumor growth, other kinds of diseases, uh, but also how to sort of um, uh, approach tissue engineering or tissue regeneration. So in the context of wound healing as well. So there's some applications in those areas a little bit now too. And increasingly we're interested in thinking about the different types of quantitative data that can be, can be collected um, from various experiments and how to use those or how to kind of use models to interrogate those data to kind of provide new understanding. So it's very much about this link between models and data. And so just to highlight this, um, and again, it's a sort of preaching to the converted, but we try and work um, in, in many situations with experimental groups who are looking at both in wild type and perturbed scenarios. Um, and we try and understand the sort of data they're generating using models and simulations of those models but increasingly a focus of our group is to think about methods for data analysis and model testing, really so that we can go along this cycle where we predict, or we take um, sort, of, uh, sort of predictions that have come from experiments, we test them with the model, refine them uh, sort of as and when we see that we haven't got things quite right, and then we use the model to make new predictions that can be tested experimentally. Um, and very much the first kind of, so this is going to be a talk of two parts, but very much the first part of the talk is going to focus on being able to do that um, and, and really as a result of careful comparison of models and data. Um, but first of all, I think I wanted to say, have a bit of a think about the sort of challenges of working with quantitative data. Um, and the things I'm going to touch on today is if we really want to kind of exploit the data that we've got, Often we need to be able to estimate the parameters of our model from experimental data. And that, that leads me into sort of asking, okay, how do I know when my model's at the right level for the data? Uh, so I think we sort of, um, as applied mathematicians have, have kind of very much sort of thought for a long time about the fact that modeling is a real sort of skill and knowing the level to build the model is incredibly sort of important. Um, and so I'm asking those kinds of questions too, but thinking about it in the context of the data I've got and how much I can pin down in my model given the data. Uh, and that leads to a question about how I estimate the parameters of the model and how certain I am or, or, of, of the, the estimates that I've got. Um, and then turning that on its head, if we go back to thinking about this predict, test, refine, predict cycle, um, how does the uncertainty that you might have in parameter estimates for your model propagate into uncertainty and model predictions because that's crucial if you you know if you are going to go away to, and test sort of model based predictions experimentally you need to be kind of certain or have some idea of the range of possible outcomes so hopefully I'm going to touch on a little bit of that today um, with some very very simple models uh, um, as well okay um so just to set the scene mostly uh, I'm thinking about um, parameter inference using a Bayesian framework. And so I'm thinking about the sort of inverse problem of asking, okay, how do I estimate the posterior distribution? So in this, in, in here, this is um, parameters theta of a model. So this is probably a parameter vector most likely. Um, and how do I estimate the probability of parameters theta in my model given data D? And I want to write that um, as being proportional to the product of the likelihood of the data given the parameters and the prior distribution where the prior just represents any um, sort of previous knowledge I might have about parameters. So if I'm talking about diffusion coefficients, I might um, have some idea of the range of potential diff diffusion coefficients in the model and I can feed that in. So the first, um, the first kind of case study I want to talk about is mechanisms of mRNA localization and, and why that process could be made robust. 
So what's the idea? Um, essentially, what a cell needs to do is to get sort of proteins in the right place at the right time in order to be able to uh, perform a particular job or a task. So for example, establishing the body axes, looking at um, sort of cell migration, so cell polarization um, and aspects of synaptic plasticity. Um, and the idea is that it's kind of quite tricky to kind of make a protein in one particular place in the cell and then get that protein to the right place at the right time in order to perform that job. And in particular, that's quite a difficult thing to do for very big cells. And so uh, instead, what happens is that the cell effectively um, transcribes the mRNA, moves the mRNA to the right place in the cell, and then lets that translate the protein. So it's essentially a kind of way of ensuring that you get the protein to the right place at the right time uh, in, in a nice sort of robust fashion. And we sort of came at this project joint with experimental collaborators trying to understand this process and, and, and sort of what makes it robust. Okay, so what controls it and what makes it robust is a good question. And we're working in the context of Drosophila. So this is very uh, a picture of a uh, uh, sort of um, uh, a series of just Drosophila uh, sort of egg chambers. So what you see here is um, these are sort of like, this is loads and loads of Drosophilas essentially sort of developing. And one of these kind of along one of these particular strings, you can see uh, here, 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 and here, we've got these uh, sort of Drosophila, if you like, in various stages of development. So right at the top, they're much younger. And as you go down towards the bottom, they begin to uh, sort of, they're increasingly sort of further along the developmental process. So we're gonna use um, one of these uh, Drosophila egg chambers as a means to understand mechanisms that might drive mRNA localization and its robustness. So let's just take one of those and, and think about what it looks like. So again, we can just illustrate that as you go sort of along this sort of, it's almost like a string that's got these different Drosophila uh, sort of egg chambers attached to it. As long as, as you move along one of these strings, you can see that the Drosophila are increasingly well developed. Um, but Drosophila starts life obviously as a single cell and then there's a stereotypical set of cell divisions that takes it from a single cell to a group of 16 cells. Um, and this is the kind of just a real sketch of sort of the process and how those cells are sort of wired. So at the 16 cell stage, um, actually there's only one cell that's called the oocyte that's actually ever going to contribute to Drosophila sort of properly. And then the rest of the cells, S15 cells, uh, which are called nurse cells, are essentially just supporting cells. And um, what you see in this figure is that you've got a number of mRNA, so Gherkin, Oscar, and Bicoid being just some of them, that are essentially localized to specific regions of the oocyte. And what they end up doing is they end up setting up um, sort of maternal protein gradients that then kind of drive symmetry breaking within the Drosophila uh, embryo. And the idea is that within Drosophila, um, mRNA localization, so putting the mRNAs in the right place is, is very important. Um, what else did I want to say? The other thing I wanted to say is that Drosophila is kind of quite interesting at that stage because as the cells divide, so you go from one through 16 cells, the cell divisions are incomplete. So these lines here are sort of um, drawn to indicate that actually there's small kind of bridges that connect the cells. Those bridges are called ring canals and they allow material to move between the nurse cells and eventually into the embryo or into the oocyte. So what we see at least, and I'll sort of say this again, I think is that um, you, you see all of these, um, these RNAs that you can see are actually produced all in the nurse cells and they're transported through these passages, um, which are called ring canals, into the oocyte and then localized to the right place. And so we want to understand why that is a good thing to do and how, it, how it's robust and how it's controlled. Oh. Okay, so here's a picture, uh, an image of what this might look like in reality. So now you're seeing gherkin um, mRNA. So these are these little red spots that you can see. Um, here you can see three uh, nurse cells and you can see that there's already a, a, a huge amount of, of, of gherkin mRNA localized uh, to the site. So that's what it looks like uh, from an image. And if we just take a series of, um, a, a sort of scan through the, the um, the egg chamber, what you can see is sort of all these different nurse cells that are packed together in a very, very sort of stereotypical arrangement, I should have said. Um, and you can see that there's gherkin sort of present in all of them and in particular in the oocyte. So as we go, this is the oocyte here, 
and you'll begin to pick out ring canals. So you can see there's one there and there's one here very clearly, there's one there. Um, so these are these bridges that allow the cells to essentially um, transport mRNA into the, into the oocyte. Okay, so what's going on? I've said this sort of already, but during the process of, of oogenesis, um, these mRNAs are produced in the maternal nurse cells. They're not actually produced in the oocyte at all. Uh, and they're transported through this um, sort of network of ring canals and cells into the oocyte where they're localized. So we want to understand this transport process, what sort of what's controlling this process and what, why, why it might be robust. So we're going to come up with a super simple model. And this was, um, I should say that we went through like a, a huge series of models before we came down to something that was, that was, just, that was this simple. Um, that went through a huge kind of, um, <laughs> they're, they're on a huge number of sort of different levels with a varying complexity. And this was the kind of model in the end that we felt was relevant for this sort of level of data that we could easily collect. So this model is just a compartment-based ODE model. And all we want to do is to track the number of mRNAs in each of the 16 cells. So this is the 15 nurse cells on the east side. One of the things I should have said before is I'm often gonna use the term RNA complexes because in effect, what happens is that the mRNAs, uh, the transcripts are produced in the, in the nucleus there, uh, transported then through the, uh, into the cytoplasm and then they're packaged up together with, um, so there's a number of mRNAs packaged up together with some proteins and it's the, these kind of complexes that are actually transported um, sort of together on the on the um, the underlying sort of microtubule network of the of the cell. So I'm often going to refer to them as mRNA or RNA complexes. So we're considering um, a model that looks at basically how many complexes you've got in each of these 16 cells. We're going to assume there's some kind of bias transports of um, RNA. Um, complexes between cells if they're connected by uh, a ring canal and that we've got production of RNA in each of the cells. And um, in sort of the fields, uh, it, it, what's kind of quite useful is that the, the, there's a very standard way in which you number these cells. So one is always the oocytes, uh, two, three, five and nine are always the cells that are kind of one away from the oocytes and then then the, the sort of numbers uh, sort of continue sort of almost, I think about it in layers away from the, the oocyte. So we have a nice way to label everything um, that's consistent with the biology. Okay, and then again, it couldn't, almost couldn't be, this was like the simplest model I think you can possibly write down about in terms of the system where Y is just a vector that tells you the number of, um, of complexes in each cell. You've got production at some rate A, uh, the vector V just tells you that you have production everywhere apart from in the oocyte, which is cell number one. And then the last term represents transport. So underlying rate B, and then this matrix B, which is a function of mu, just encodes two things. It, it just tells you one that, um, or it just encodes the, the kind of connectivity of the cell. So it tells you where the, the ring canal sits. Um, and also then there's this parameter nu, which just represents bias. Um, and so bias is always, weirdly, um, bias away from the oocyte. So nu would be the rate from moving from one to two or from two to two to six. Uh, and and I, I have no idea why this is the case, given that we kind of know it's in the other direction, but that's very much standard in the field. So again, this is a really, really simple, simple model. And the idea was really just to ask whether we can pin down all the components of this model enough to understand the process and think about why it's robust. So you can write down a solution to the model, um, which is nice, uh, and you can think about typical behavior of the solution. So we often just plot number of complexes as a function of the cell ID. And the only thing you really need to remember is that, that one is the oocyte, um, and that more or less as you go up through the numbers, you get further away. From the oocytes. Okay, so that's typical behavior of the solution. How do we think about inferring the parameters? So again, I said we were going to work in a Bayesian framework, thinking about estimating the posterior distribution of parameters theta given data d in terms of the likelihood and the prior. Um, and what did we need in order to do that? So we needed to put 
uh, it's a sort of um, use a measurement model. So uh, Z is basically the observation that, that we would have from looking at any, a series of embryos, and then Y is the solution to the, the ODE model. And so the measurement model also induces essentially two more parameters. So there's one which is characterizes essentially the variability um, in, your, in your measurements. And the other one is this parameter phi. And it's sort of, um, it's a bit of a complication really, but what's happening is that what happens in reality is that, uh, let's see if I can go back, as mRNA complexes are transported from cells two, three, five, and nine into the oocyte, there's a kind of higher order assembly process, which basically just means that multiple of, of these complexes are stitched together. Uh, so when you see uh, sort of one of those bright red spots in the oocyte, there's more mRNAs in one of those than there is in um, any of the nurse cells. So, so this parameter phi basically just characterizes that assembly process. Um, okay, so now we've got uh, parameters A and B, which are the sort of production and transport rates. We've got nu, which is the bias, and then phi and sigma. So we've got five parameters that we need to infer. Um, and I sort of, I kind of hinted that this, I, this, uh, sorry, this a complex assembly was a bit of a headache. And the reason it is really is that it makes the model um, non-identifiable given the data that we sort of were seeking to use. So it's quite, so one thing that was quite clear is that if we wanted to make progress in identifying the parameters of this model, we were gonna need to estimate this assembly parameter first. So now um, gherkins in, in, in sort of this pinky purple color, but what we actually did was then um, went away, looked at a number of images and looked at the intensity of these uh, sort of complexes in the nurse cells, in the oocytes, and also looked at the background and used those um, sort of estimates of intensity to try and quantify or to, to, to try and inform um, sort of estimates of this assembly parameter. So median value of it is about 0.4, which tells you on average like two and a half of these complexes are stitched together as they pass from the nurse cells surrounding the oocyte into the oocyte itself. Um, so the nice thing about having access to that kind of information is that it allows you to specify a relatively strong prior for phi in the full model, and that kind of essentially alleviates many of the identifiability issues that, that we had. So okay, so we've 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 kind of dealt with one parameter, if you like, um, by looking at some sort of so, some other kinds of data, and let's go back to the full model. So I guess the nice thing that you can do is to look at this sort of quasi steady distribution within the model. So effectively, let's just focus on the distribution of, of complex numbers across the 16 cells. And that means that I can, for now, ignore the rate constants A and B uh, relating to production and transport, and then just really focus on estimating the, the bias parameter new. So we, we did that compared with data. And starting with a, a fairly uniform uh, prior distribution uh, uh, for the transport parameter, and you, what you can see is that you end up with a really, really tightly peaked posterior distribution, um, telling you that transport is essentially incredibly biased towards the towards the oocyte. And it probably doesn't tell us anything we don't know because if things are going to accumulate within the oocyte, we need that transport to be biased. But it was good to see that we could pin down that parameter with really quite a high degree of, of confidence. And you can do a posterior predictive check just to uh, sort of uh, check that your, you, your kind of inference is consistent with your data. So these red dots are all uh, data that were connected from a number of different embryos or oocytes uh, or egg chambers even. Uh, and then uh, you can see that we've done a pretty good job where the gray is essentially sort of what happens if you draw from the model repeatedly and simulate. So this is the kind of um, the breadth of the, the outcomes you would expect. So, so that was all looking positive. And then the last thing to do is to go back and to look at things in the full dynamic regime. And when you do that, uh, you can get relatively good. So these are posterior distributions for the parameters A and parameters B. Um, you can get, again, relatively tightly peaked posterior distribution. So I'm sort of relatively happy that these parameters can be confidently estimated from the data. Uh, and actually on top of that, if you sort of look in this dynamic regime, um, this, uh, what we sort of notice is essentially A is approximately on the same order of magnitude as B times the average number of um, 
RNA complexes, suggesting that essentially production and transport are relatively um, sort of well balanced and both are important in this localization process. And again, you can do a posterior predictive check where you essentially sample multiple times from your posterior distribution and just check that your data lies within the range of outputs that you'd expect. Yeah, that was all well and good and I guess our, our results so far suggest that you know we have a model that's essentially pretty much at the right level for the data and confirms that transport and production are both important in this process. Again maybe maybe we'd expect this but it's nice to see it sort of borne out if you like um, in the model. So we wanted to sort of push this a bit and see see uh, kind of how well our model would stand up to some perturbations uh, sort of to the to, to the U site or to the egg chamber. Um, and so the way in which we did that was we looked at um, an overexpression mutant. So the idea in the overexpression mutant is that you have more, two copies of the Gherkin gene in every cell rather than just one. So in theory, if that expression, uh, overexpression mutant is kind of working well, you'd expect to be generating mRNAs, uh, Gherkin mRNAs at twice the rate that you would do in the wild type. So the simplest possible ex model extension is to just stick a two in front of the uh, production rates and just ask questions about whether that model uh, does a good job in predicting the data that you actually see in the overexpression mutant. And what we're really focusing on is does it well predict the rate or the, uh, the rate of accumulation of um, mRNAs or the number of mRNA complexes that you see in new sites in the overexpression mutant. Um, and so here's what the model predictions look like. So this is essentially taking the red dots of data from this overexpression mutant. And the gray sort of shaded areas are the, the, uh, the sort of predictions that come out of the model um, parameterized to wild type. And so what you should be able to see is if you look kind of in the U site or relatively close to the U site. So this is, and I should have said this before, sorry, this is, um, these are data that are arranged in terms of how far in their cell is away from the U site. So one is the U site itself. This is kind of the first uh, layer of cells away from the U site, second layer, third layer, and fourth layer. Um, so what you see is that if you look in the U site itself or in any of the cells that are directly kind of neighboring and connected to the U site, you're doing a pretty good job in predicting the dynamics that you see in this overexpression mutant. But if you move further away, Kind of your ability to predict the, the data really sort of decreases and in particular we're really with the model beginning to, to underestimate the amount of, of, of mRNAs that we see or the complexes that we see in the nurse cells. So um, my sort of the sort of very sort of simple message from this is that actually no we're not you know something else is, is happening here we're not we're not doing a good job at capturing the dynamics of this system um, just by extending this model in a sort of simple, simple way. And therefore, there's other mechanisms that must be at play that are somehow regulating this process. Okay. Um, and this is just another figure, I think that, again, this is experimental data that just confirms this. So this is uh, the number of mRNA complexes that we see in the U site and how uh, over time. And so you can see the wild types in sort of blue and the overexpression mutant is in red. And you see that there's basically very little difference between them. They're more or less accumulating um, gherkin at the same rates, which tells you that effectively, despite the fact that the overexpression mutant is kind of pumping out mRNA um, complexes at twice the rate, they're simply not accumulating at twice the rate in the wild type, right? It's buffering against uh, this perturbation to essentially leave things as they they uh, they should be in, in wild type. So let's ask some questions about how that how that could happen. So we we sort of talked a lot about this and came up with lots and lots of different things that could be happening. Um, but these are sort of the three that that seem to be the sort of most consistent with uh, sort of our uh, understanding experimentally of this system. So what could be happening? Uh, there could just be essentially a blocking of ring canal. So it's sort of like uh, lots of people trying to exit a stadium at the same time through these narrow corridors that there's, there essentially gets to be sort of queuing, right? So maybe it's, it's simply the fact that there's lots of 
uh, lots of these mRNAs trying to uh, be transported down these narrow channels and, and essentially they just sort of become blocked and the sort of transport limited process. Um, the other thing that could be happening is that our overexpression mutant might not be quite as good as we hoped it was. So instead of having two copies of the Gherkin uh, gene in every cell, it's, it's quite likely that, or it seemed quite likely to us that there could be um, only one copy in many of the cells, and maybe that was actually sort of what was happening that was causing this observed robustness. Um, or else it could be some kind of density dependent transport mechanism. So I mentioned that essentially the sort of transport process actually involves multiple mRNAs being um, sort of stitched together with some proteins, and that this it was this kind of complex that was transported on the microtubule network um, around the cell. Uh, and through the ring canals. And, and I think the last thing in here really just kind of acknowledges the fact that at some point that transport sort of network might become saturated. And so you simply could just can't get mRNAs um, through the system sort of quick enough. So they were the, the sort of three, um, three mechanisms that we came up with that could be impacting sort of transport within the system and effectively le leading to robustness. So the idea was that we could kind of represent um, all of these different um, potential hypotheses as a collection of models and then use model comparison approaches to think about how plausible each one of them was. So you've kind of got the wild type sort of scenario where you just sort of multiply by the um, production rate by two, and then you've got all the combinations of, uh, of blocking of ring canals and homogeneous production and density dependent transports kind of added to that, that model. So you end up with a collection of seven models and we wanted to evaluate which one of those was most essentially most consistent with the data. So to do that, we used the posterior predictive distribution, which essentially allows you to evaluate um, the kind of plausibility of the model based on how well they can predict sort of future behaviors based on things that, uh, um, that they sort of see, if you like. So effectively, we were asking here, what's the probability uh, uh, of, of seeing sort of data Y tilled given your sort of model trained is trained on data Y. Um, and this is in here, M just represents the fact that you're considering a particular model. So you can use these ideas to evaluate the sort of weight associated with each model. Um, and we did that in two, using two slightly different methods to calculate the weights. And here's the outcome. So in the table, what I'm just sort of showing you is, is kind of which of these mechanisms is turned on in which of the different models. So for example, M0 was the base model. And then M1 just says, okay, I'm gonna assume that blocking of ring canals is the, the mechanism, that, the additional mechanism. M3 density dependent transport, sorry, M2 density dependent transport and M3 production, and then the others kind of um, combinations of all of those, of each of those. So here's the results. So, so, this, so what you should read here is that where a model has got uh, a larger weight, it should be preferred as a, if you like, an, uh, uh, as a, uh, a mechanism that could give rise to the data. And under the first type of weight we consider, you can see that it really comes out strongly in favor of model one, which is that, that um, what's happening in here is that there's this sort of blocking or crowding, if you like, at ring canals that is essentially um, sort of um, uh, meaning that uh, more mRNAs are sort of remaining stuck in the outer kind of nurse cells. And so you're seeing robustness. So that's that's these first weights that sort of indicate. And then we also use a different type of weighting called stacking weights, which are a bit more um, conservative, you might say. But again, model one, which assumes blocking of ring canals came up on top. And then I think the next one was model uh, five, which is basically a model that again includes blocking um, and also says probably there's a bit of inhomogeneity in the production rate. And, and so that means that we might not have multiple or two copies of Gherkin in every cell. Uh, and, and that probably is in many cases um, playing a role. But certainly it seems that blocking is maybe uh, sort of the most important, if you like, mechanism that's contributing to this robustness. So it would be nice to go away and sort of test this, uh, test this very, um, very, very carefully, and we haven't managed to do this yet, but what we did manage to do was to go away and look at some of the data we have and just see whether we can see this sort of piling up of, 
and, and mRNA complexes around uh, ring canals. And this is just one image of, of, of many we found where you see this kind of um, this sort of pileup of, of mRNA. So keep switching color, but here the mRNA is in green and you can see that there's quite there's a lot of them concentrated around this, this ring canal. So that lends support to the, the hypothesis of the model. So to finish up with this part of the talk, hopefully what I've convinced you is that although we had um, a very, very, very simple model, um, the fact that we could connect it to data uh, using Bayesian inference gave us a really powerful means to distinguish between the hypotheses. And in this context, um, for Gherkin mRNA localization, it's really that there's a, a balance between production and transport. Um, so, so both are important to the process uh, and that sort of crowding of the protein complexes um, at the ring canals is what's helping to regulate the process and make it robust in the face of quite significant perturbations. Okay. So I'm going to switch tack totally now, but if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now or all that can happen at the end. No? Okay, I'll keep going, um, but do shout out if there's anything. Um, so something that I sort of mentioned a little bit in terms of the previous project, um, but, but could sort of deal with by looking at other kinds of data is identifiability of the model. So what happens if I write down a model that where effectively I can't pin down the parameters of my model with the data and how do I deal with that and how do I detect it are some questions that we began to think about. And that sort of relates to the idea of um, being able to determine the kind of relevant level on which to build a model given the data you have. So we're going to talk about that uh, for a little while now for a bit shorter than, than the, 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 the previous example, but and hopefully just demonstrate when it's important. So switching tack on a different spatial scale, we're looking at macro scale models for in vitro wound healing. So what's the idea? Um, I showed a, a figure with some data in it before from a, what's called a scratch assay. So the idea with the scratch assay is that you want to think about mimicking maybe a wound healing um, sort of scenario and you grow a population of cells to confluence in a dish. And then at kind of time zero, if you like, you either take a pipette or use a machine to scratch away a portion of cells uh, down the middle of the, the dish. Um, and so, and then typically what happens is you image a kind of small portion in the, in the middle of the dish, which kind of contains the scratch. And what you do is you wait and you see as the, the sort of wound closes over time. So these are kind of canonical assays that are used all over the place to, um, uh, to, 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 to kind of probe all manner of sort of questions. They're, they, you know, hugely ubiquitous. Um, and so we're interested in thinking about writing down models of these assays and to what extent we can um, parameterize them. What was nice about this particular uh, assay that was carried out was that we used the Fucci reporter to label the cell cycle. So it, sort of the very kind of simple explanation here is that as the cell progresses through its cell cycle, it will fluoresce different colors. So if it's in, in G1 phase, it'll for all intents and purposes, it will look red. And then when it moves into S, G2, M phase of the cell cycle, it appears green. So as you follow a cell over time, it will first look red, switch to looking green, and then it will divide to give rise to two, two cells in G1, which will progress to G2, and et cetera, et cetera. So we, we were just gonna characterize the kind of progression through the cell cycle in terms of these rate parameters, K, R, and KG. I switched the order of the slides around now, so I have to think <laughs> what comes next. Um, so this is just an example of the experimental data we have for this system. So we've got images uh, at a range of time intervals over 48 hour period. Uh, you can see the initial sort of scratch in this assay, uh, and you can see by 48 hours, there's a, although it's not sort of, I would say, fully closed, it's, it's probably close, close to. Um, you can also see that you've got cells both in uh, G1 and G2 phases of the cell cycle as well. So you can certainly see that these cells are cycling and they're, they're dividing over time. What I also really like about scratch assays is that um, effectively they're, they're kind of pseudo one dimensional, right? So that you can just average everything in the Y direction and that gives you access to 
um, a sort of relatively smooth one dimensional density profile. So here it's just in terms of observed um, density of red and of green cells. So you can you can make everything simpler uh, in terms of the data, but also in terms of the models you write down, because as soon as you've done that averaging, you're kind of considering models that are, are just one dimensional, which is good. So so the biological kind of question or the question we're asking of the data is, are they sufficient to determine whether cells move with a different, spa different speed Sorry, in G1 versus SG2 and M? And the reason that we might be interested to think about it is that there's lots of kind of, especially in the sort of cancer literature, lots of kind of um, support now, I think, for this idea of a go or grow hypothesis. So the idea is that if a cell is going to, uh, when a cell divides, it essentially rounds up and it comes, becomes much less motile. So a cell is either kind of motile and non-proliferative or proliferative and much less motile. And we were asking the question whether there's, in a simple assay like this, whether there would be sufficient data, say if I was looking at a cancer cell line, to determine whether, um, or, or to motivate writing down a model where the cells move with different speeds according to their different phases of the cell cycle. So we're asking that kind of, we're asking this question. Um, and you can sort of maybe turn that around in its head and just say, is the data, is the data that I'm collecting the right kind of data to, to determine this as well? So we started thinking much more about identifiability. And um, I think just as an aside, really, I sort of split identifiability thoughts into two tracks. One is to think about structural identifiability, which really just asks the question, if I have different parameter values for my um, prior distribution or potential parameter values for my model, um, do they give rise to distinct distributions of outputs? So um, really what they're sort of saying is, is, is it possible, or at least if that is the case, then it should be possible if I have essentially perfect input output data, it should be possible to pin down the values of the model parameters. Um, so uh, structural identifiability is kind of the, 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 the base case, if you like. But for me, um, it's not always the most useful concept because uh, we just really don't have perfect input output data in, in biology or anything close to. So we're often only able to um, record data maybe from a subset of the species uh, in our system or the populations in our system um, is certainly not generally well resolved in time and um, uh, and also it's usually very very noisy so th this can be something that's 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 kind of not a particularly useful concept so on the other hand <laughs> we might think about the much woollier or loosely defined more loosely defined concept of practical identifiability which really just asks can i get reasonably precise estimates um, of the parameters in my model using um, the data that I actually have available. Um, and maybe you can kind of extend that to think about, okay, kind of if a model isn't identifiable given some data you have, what data would I have to go away and additionally collect in order to kind of render it practically identifiable? So that's maybe the positive spin on it. Okay, so going back to our wound tuning assays, which were, sorry, way back up here, we're going to be interested in developing just some very, very simple PDE models um, that just basically represent cell motility via diffusion. And then we've got some um, reaction kinetics that represents um, transitions through the cell cycle and also division. OK, so what do the models look like? So for model one, then cells have um, different speeds in different phases of the cell cycle. So a very, very standard sort of um, PDE model where I'm looking at density of red and of green cells. Um, I've got diffusion to represent random motility and for the red cells they've got diffusion coefficient dr and for the green cells it's something different dg. And then my reaction kinetics uh, just represent as I said progression through the cell cycle so this is just uh, um, transition from g1 into g2 um, SG2M phase. And then these terms on the end basically that uh, are, are just cell proliferation. So the logistic like term just says that, that a cell will only divide if there's actually space for it to proliferate um, uh, into. Um, and the factor in two in here is just saying that whenever a, a cell divides, you get two cells uh, 
two daughter cells, males. And then model two is almost identical. The only difference is that um, it assumes that the cells have the same speed. And we wanted to ask, um, given a certain measurement model, um, can we justify the top model, model one, which is slightly more complicated because it assumes different speeds in different phases, or should we be better to stick to model two where we can actually sort of pin down the, the details more easily possibly. Um, so in both cases, I'm going to assume observation error to be just normally distributed and um, zero mean and known variance parameters. So the idea here is that I might estimate in this context um, the variance parameter a priori, but I don't necessarily need, need to do that. Okay, and again, just to remind you, we're interested in um, the posterior distribution of parameters theta given data D. So in this context, the parameters are the diffusion coefficients or coefficient uh, and the reaction kinetic parameters, so the KR and the KG. And we're interested in um, accessing that through the product of the likelihood and the prior. So in this context, I have access to the likelihood numerically because I can effectively solve for a given set of parameter values. I can solve those PDE models given some initial conditions um, and domain and boundary conditions. And then I can essentially just apply that measurement noise model on top of that. So that's, um, that's quite nice. It's a benefit maybe of the PDE model framework. And I'm gonna think about identifiability analysis from two perspectives and um, really just to highlight that there are different ways to think about evaluating practical identifiability and that um, you know some of those methods are I think more efficient than others so maybe could be preferred. So approach one is effectively that we could just sample the posterior distribution um, for this model uh, using a uh, Metropolis Hastings MCMC algorithm with the usual sort of acceptance probability. Uh, so when I do that, I would, again, like loosely speaking, um, if I look at the sort of trace plots from that NCMC, I would uh, identify, uh, well, identify, or is it characterize non-identifiability as poorly converging chains. Um, and if I looked at the posterior distributions, they would probably be very broad. Um, but the other thing I could do, and it's not, I think, all oh, so, so much used is to think about the profile likelihood. So what does that mean? Effectively, I'm going to look at the normalized likelihood and um, I'm going to partition up the parameters in my model. So let's just assume we've got a diffusion coefficient D and the rate parameters K, R and K, G. So I might just for argument's sake say I'm interested just in profiling uh, the likelihood of the diffusion coefficient. So that would be my interest parameter. And then my nuisance parameter or parameters lambda would just be the, the kinetic, um, the rate constants, KR and KG. And the idea to get the profile likelihood is I essentially work across a grid of values for the diffusion coefficients. And for every point on that grid, I'm just gonna um, look at the uh, optimizing the, the essentially the normalized likelihood over all of the other parameters, so over K, R and K, G in this context, okay? So the idea is that that tells me essentially how quickly uh, the likelihood changes um, uh, sort of for, as, as I move across values of that parameter. And then essentially, if it's non-identifiable, uh, the model then, then will, I'll get flat likelihood profiles and, and, and half open confidence intervals. So just to, the point I wanted to make about this is that, um, so approach one, when we think about doing MCMC, um, that can take a really, really long time. Um, and particularly if I don't know, you know, I don't have a good idea about a sort of uh, sensible proposal distribution, this can take, um, this, can, this, can, this can really be a computationally sort of um, uh, difficult thing to do. Uh, especially for very high dimensional, um, high dimensional models in terms of parameter space. Um, whereas approach two, which thinks about the normalized likelihood is really just um, a series of, um, of optimizations, right? Uh, and so there's incredibly you know, good uh, algorithms out there to, to, to evaluate the profile likelihood very, very quickly. And so I think this is maybe much, uh, maybe, um, maybe something that could be preferred and, and as I'll demonstrate, hopefully, um, provide you with the same kind of information, but a fraction of the cost. Um, 
So here's, I'll show you first though the MCMC results. So this is what happens when you try to um, uh, estimate the parameters from the first model, which if you remember had different diffusion coefficients um, for the two species or the two subpopulations of cells. What you see if you look at the trace plots for the, the, the kinetic parameters is they relatively quickly settle down to uh, quite, sort of quite nicely. And if you look at the corresponding um, sort of marginal posterior distributions, they're really quite tight, uh, tightly peaked, um, suggesting that those parameters are identifiable given the data. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the trace plots for the um, the diffusion coefficients, they, they, they move around all over parameter space. It doesn't matter how long you um, how long you let these chains run for, they just never settle down. And kind of coincident with that, you see these um, hugely broad uh, sort of posterior distributions. So you're learning virtually nothing about the kind of values of the, the possible values of the parameters. So I'd say in this context that this model, given the data we've got, isn't practically identifiable. On the other hand, if we switch to looking at model two, where the only difference is we've got a common diffusion coefficient, you can see straight away that, again, the results for the kinetic parameters are as just as good as they were in terms of these um, sort of nicely peaked posterior distributions. Um, but on top of that, I also have a similar kind of behavior for the diffusion coefficient. So the chains settle down quite nicely and then I get a correspondingly relatively tight uh, posterior distribution. And again, the posterior predictive checks, I should have said, are uh, sort of confirm that the, the model is doing um, a, a good job in, in terms of predicting the data. So uh, in this context, I'd say this model is practically uh, identifiable given these, these data. So all well and good, but as I said, that take, those kind of plots take a, a while to sort of generate. So can I use profile likelihood analysis to get at the same kind of idea? So what you do, as I said before, is as you move over a grid of values for a particular parameter, you're essentially looking at optimizing the likelihood um, sort of the of the data um, over the kind of other two parameters. So here we're optimizing over uh, Kg and D in order to produce this sort of profile. And again, consistent with the MCMC results, what you see is that you get these nicely peaked um, sort of likely uh, profile likelihoods for both the kinetic parameters for model two, but also for the diffusion coefficient. And when you go back to model one, which has these different diffusion coefficients, then you see that that changes, that story changes quite dramatically. And the, um, the, the profiles are much shallower. Um, and we really know that we it's sort of essentially what's happening is the likelihood of the data isn't changing very much over quite large regions of the parameters. And so they're not, not identifiable. Um, so to hammer home the point, uh, profile likelihood analysis here gives you very similar information to the MCMC analysis, but at a real fraction of the, the cost. So I'm going to finish up now um, just by saying that I think the take home message of this study was that this model, the model, the first model we kind of came up with, which is sort of, I think, relatively well um, established in the literature where cells move at sort of different speeds according to their phase of their cell cycle isn't identifiable given these data. And that simply means that we should be quite careful in making predictions using this model for data or, or scenarios that we haven't, we haven't seen because we haven't got a good idea about kind of how uh, our predictions might vary across sort of the, the range of parameter values it emits. Um, whereas model two that is making the assumption that there's no difference in, in kind of the cell motility is practically identifiable. And I should say that both of those models, I think, are structurally identifiable given sufficient data. So it's not a case of, 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 of kind of the underlying model. It's really about the data that we have that's driving those differences. Uh, so this take home message, uh, I can think, consider the limitations of the data in building the model. And if we can use the identifiability analysis during the model building process, I think that gives us a really nice way to think about the, the level of model that's appropriate or flipping that on its head to think about um, the kinds of data that we might need to facilitate the use of a model um, at a given level. Okay, so as a summary, um, I think I've shown hopefully that uh, we can use very, very simple models, but by connecting them tightly with data, we can make some get some quite nice insights into sort of biological mechanisms. And they're definitely insights that we wouldn't have been able to get had we not carried out this very careful comparison of model predictions and data. 
Um, and that in building a model, I think thinking about identifiability is really crucial um, and that profile likelihoods can provide, uh, I think, quite a nice means to, uh, to, 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 or quite a nice approach or method to use within the model construction process. And finally, just to say that I think taking this Bayesian approach enabled us to kind of quantify how uncertainty um, in parameter estimates led into model predictions. And in the first um, sort of example, really see when our, when our model is probably failing. Okay, so just um, thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. Um, this work, well, the first half of this work was all done really by Jonathan Harrison when he was a PhD student here in Oxford in collaboration with Elan Davis and Richard Parton here in biochemistry here in Oxford. And then the second half was done in collaboration with Matt Simpson at QUT and Oliver McLaren, who was a postdoc in Oxford and nurse now in Auckland.